Hey, I'm James from the Smoking Dad Barbecue, and today I am sharing my top secret baby back rib recipe because we are going to be injecting it with bacon fat. Let me tell you why. So today I'm breaking down the double standard in barbecue. Double standard? Well, if we were talking about beef like this ribeye steak or a brisket, there are plenty of videos documenting the benefits of using something like Wagyu beef tallow. Now I've actually done a complete head to head of the Wagyu beef tallow. This cost me about $30 versus tallow that I made for free <laughs> if I wasn't discarding it, trimmed from my own briskets. And my strong bias here is to make your own. I don't think you can discern the premium Wagyu beef tallow from fat that you render from your own brisket trimmings. But I'll put a link down to that video if you want to check out the exact details, as well as some modifications to making your own tallow that turn out an absolute winner. But when it comes to pork, there is not the equivalent fanfare of fat, whether it's in wrapping or injecting. And today I want to share how that might be robbing you of some of the most tasty ribs you've ever had in your life. In barbecue, there are a ton of opinions on this topic, but instead of going with the opinions, since I won't be able to cover them all in one video, I'm going with some scientific research that has helped inform this technique that I've tested. And so this comes from meat scientist, Dr. Tony Mata. He has a great article uh, on amazingribs.com as well as a couple other places. But the punchline here is meat is like a wet sponge. That's water-based, fat is an oil, oil and water don't mix. So this whole idea of the reason you put your brisket fat cap up is so that the fat will melt into the meat simply isn't true. And again, I don't have the time to go and explain all the reasons why that doesn't work, but the same is true as wrapping our ribs or our brisket and putting a bunch of fat into the pouch, hoping that it, it will absorb it to the meat. This just scientifically isn't what happens. Now, not saying there's not a benefit of adding some fat into our pouch, whether that's foil or going with butcher paper like I'll be using today. If we've overdone it and we've gone nuclear on our bark and dried it out, fat, can help soften up something that is dry and crispy and act as a little bit of an undo button for getting carried away with the temperatures or the dryness of our bark. It can fix that. The other thing that it can do is fat can coat the outside and make it look nice and shiny for YouTube pictures or Instagram. So it, it looks wonderful and it looks like a flavorful brisket. But again, none of this is actually being uh, absorbed into the meat. And third, it can help cover up a little bit of operator air. If we overcooked and dried out our food, if you absolutely drench whatever you're eating with oil, oil covers the tongue. That's the first thing that uh, hits our palate, it saturates it, and it can help mask the fact that what we've cooked is actually a little bit of dry. So there's some benefits to adding fat, even though none of them actually include the fat rendering or going deep inside of our meat. But just as there's some benefits, there's also some downsides of using fat. It can start to wash away those amazing bark flavors that we've developed, particularly if we get it absolutely right and it's not overdone and dry, adding a bunch of fat and just sitting in that will start to braise whatever it is that we're cooking and rob us of some of that bark flavor, particularly if we're cooking in something like my offset smoker, which we'll be doing today. Secondly, this can just skyrocket our costs. If we start adding these extra premium fats uh, into our regular cooking routine, something that was already not inexpensive becomes that much more uh, expensive. So today I'm going to share a method for no extra cost. Assuming that you already have bacon, you cook it regularly in your house, how to save that and turn out some of the best ribs you've ever had. Let me explain how. So our first order of business is going to be getting a fire going in our smoker. I'm going to be doing today's cook on my Smoke North uh, Gen 2 here on Offset, mostly because this past weekend was Canada's largest rib fest. And despite being Canada's largest rib fest, there wasn't a good rib to be found here. And I actually just want a rib done right. So I'm going to be doing today's cook on my Offset smoker. I like to get a heat soak fire going uh, right away. That's going to take about 40 minutes to maximum 60 minutes to burn down. So I use kiln dried birch wood from the grocery store as it help spike up our temperatures. We'll see, you know, 400 degrees, no problem. That's going to help make sure that our pit is fully heat soaked and it'll really stabilize everything for the rest of our cook. And we'll have a great coal bed uh, from there on out. I'll be using oak and using the Jerby method for our fires for the rest of the cook. So this will be about a five hour cook. We're going to do three and a half to four hours in smoke. And the last hour or so we're going to wrap. And then to help glaze our ribs, we have a choice. We either add a bunch more firewood to get our cook chamber up to temperature, or we can cook directly in our firebox. And I like 
like to use the dying coals that we have left. There's still plenty of heat in there in our firebox, even though we're almost out of temperature in our cook chamber. And I'll use that uh, to help caramelize the sauce. So after using my uh, grill blazer grill gun to light a quick fire and start getting this up to temperature, we can work on our bacon. Now, so this depends again on how much you want to cook, but uh, a pack to a pack and a half of bacon is enough to do a uh, three racks of ribs. So I won't use all of the fat today for our two racks, but normally to get the best yield of collecting the uh, bacon fat, I like to use them in a cookie sheet covered in foil, put that in a cold oven and set it to 400 degrees and put a timer on for about 10 minutes. The bacon won't be quite done, but we can uh, go and check on it, give the bacon a little bit of a flip and see how we're doing until we get completely crisp bacon. And as the fat starts to pool on our cookie sheet, I'm gonna drain that into a coffee mug so I can extract that later using my meat injector. That's all we need for this stage. Let me take you over to the kitchen, show you how we're gonna build our dry rub as well as inject our baby back ribs for today's cook. All right, there is a lot going on in front here, but don't worry, we're not gonna use everything. So if you saw my Texas Rub Showdown, I put three of the most popular Texas barbecue joints head to head, starting with Black's, Goldie's, as well as Franklin's. And in the taste test, even though Black's won, there was a little bit of each of these rubs that we really liked. I liked some of the more salt forward flavors that you get on Black's along with what you can see in there, some of the red chili flakes. With the Goldies, a little bit stronger, you know, on the pepper, as well as um, kind of a bit of a Lowry's flavor coming in. And the Franklin's is a two-part with salt and pepper on its own, as well as this barbecue rub, which if you were to recreate this, it has a little bit more of a citric acid flavor, which is what I'm going to get inside the Lowry's. I'll put the Make Your Own Lowry's rub down below, but it has some very similar ingredients and in terms of the taste test many people actually thought uh, this was my homemade rubs that's what we're going to make up today i'll put those aside and go for my version but if you're using any of those three you're off to a great start so since we're only doing about four racks i think i'm going to start with a couple capfuls of fresh cracked pepper that should be enough to get us through these four racks so let's try our hand here with two capfuls of fresh cracked black pepper i'm using a five peppercorn melody you can see a little bit of white red black pepper <laughs> i'm not sure what the other two are it's from uh, costco so that's just giving me a couple different spices you don't need to follow along with a pepper can i just happen to make my own rubs all the time and you'd be blown away the difference that fresh spices make in your rubs and since I get about 10 times more pepper per crack, it doesn't take that long. I got a little bit more to go, but we've almost got a full cap right now. So I'll take you fast forward while I get two full caps of fresh cracked black pepper. There's number two. And just looking at the quantity, I know I said two, but I think I'm going to go for three. It'll also make our ratios easier with the salt. Since I'm going to do two thirds diamond crystal kosher salt and one third Lowry's, that'll just be a cap of each to get 50-50 salt and pepper. So I'll take you fast forward while I do one last cap full of pepper. All right, that looks good. So we now have our pepper. So we're gonna start with 50-50 salt and pepper, as I mentioned. So let's get out some diamond crystal kosher salt. And I'm gonna do two capfuls of this, add that in. And to get to our 50-50 ratio, I will do one cap full of Lowry's. And again, if you don't have Lowry's in your area, I'll put how to make your own down in the description. Okay, so we're now a 50-50 salt and pepper rub ratio. I'm gonna add just a couple extra ingredients. I guess I'll save my pepper cannon cap here for measurement, but I'm gonna go sort of two thirds garlic and the rest onion powder. Give us a little bit of a savory flavor profile. We'll go great with ribs. Next, I'm gonna add just a little bit of color. So I'm gonna go for about a half cap of smoked paprika and then about a quarter cup of cayenne. Might as well add the rest of that since we're almost out. A dash of mustard powder. We're gonna be using mustard as our binder so I don't need to add that much. Just enough to cover the top of our paprika and cayenne. And last little bit of space here, I'll sneak in a couple red pepper flakes that'll mix throughout our rub once we give this a good shake want to leave about an inch to an inch and a half at least at the top make sure we have enough space for getting everything to mix together there's all our layers let's mix them up okay that's looking good i might just add in a few more red pepper flakes looks like i can get away with a little bit more for that texture but otherwise i'm really happy with the consistency of our rub so like I mentioned at the beginning, this is a mixture of all three. You can see a couple again of those red pepper flakes along with a lot more salt and the Black's rub. So we've got for a bit of a blend taking the pepper flakes from Black's 
We've got a little bit more of that color from the Franklin's and getting some of that citric acid uh, or acidity in our rub flavor that everyone really liked uh, in this one. And then I've gone for a coarser, I don't have much left of the, uh, of the Goldies, but a coarser grain pepper uh, than something that you might get just uh, out of the bag. So we get a little bit more of that texture and people really liked the texture of the Goldies rub. So now we've got our rub ready. Let's get our ribs out of the pack and start to uh, trim them up and get our rub on. Okay, so for trimming up our ribs, I'm just gonna clean off any scraggly bits, especially down here on the end where we're getting down to a little bit of half bone. So I like to come just to the first real solid bone, give that a quick trim, and I'll throw that uh, in the pit for a bit of a pit master snack or you can save it for things like your own stock and things like that. Next, I'm gonna get some paper towel and just quickly remove the membrane. And then just working a kitchen knife underneath the membrane, you can grab that with paper towel and hopefully in one nice tug, we can get our membrane off. I've done a, an experiment side by side and it doesn't make a big difference, but today I've got the time I'm only doing four racks. That's no problem. I'll take you fast forward while I trim up our next four. Add a little bit of mustard as our binder. Don't need too much because the ribs are still a little bit of dampness on them coming out of the package, even though we did our best to dry that off. Add our dry rub, start on the bottom, and then we'll finish presentation side if I can manage the wind and not have it all blow away. So next, I've strained off the fat from cooking our bacon and just put it in a coffee mug here. Grab our meat injector, fill that up with some bacon fat. And then kind of poking down into the thick part of the meat in between each bone, we'll just give a little bit of a pump, working down the line. Hard to get an angle to show you here, but these ribs are really plumping up when we give this a little bit of a squeeze. So I'm just waiting until it starts to come up to the top, try not to have too much of that overflow like I did right there, so we can keep as much of that bacon tallow inside of our ribs little bit of a binder. All right, these look good. Now I'm gonna get some toothpicks just to help keep track of these being our two bacon ribs versus our control. We can leave these out or put them in the refrigerator for the next hour or so while we go fire up our offset and get it up to temperature. Meet you over there. Okay, I've already filled up our water pan here with water, so I'll take you fast forward, just drop this in. And the water pan on my Smoke North offset sits directly above for the baffle. So a little bit of air can come up and come over the top, but most of the hot gases coming out of the firebox are gonna hit that, which is gonna help temper them and make sure we're getting the maximum flavor out of our smoke wood. Let's go start our fire. So we'll be cooking with oak splits today, but to get my fire started, I like to use this grocery store kiln dried birch wood. Kiln dried means it's going to be easier to ignite and it's not gonna take as long before this turns into a really quick coal bed. So I've just made a little bit of an open campfire here, grab my grill blazer grill gun, and in about a minute's time, we will be off to the races. Take a fast forward while I fire this up. Okay, our heat soak fire has died down, so I'm just gonna break what's left down into some coals. Add some wood splits that have been heating. So this is the Jerby Fire method, which works amazing in something like my 110 gallon Huron Gen 2 offset from Smoke North. That's gonna hold about 270 degrees, nice and stable. So the way to do that is place two logs along the base right here with some coal bed in the middle. Then grabbing three more heat soaked splits from the top, I'm gonna place those nice and tight so we are controlling our airflow and getting a bit of a knockdown fire. Again, this is the Jerby fire method, which works amazing in something the size of this 110 gallon offset. In my smaller offsets like my Oklahoma Joe's, check out my fire management video to get a, a great fire in something like a 30, 60, 80, like my Carlisle, or even my 110 gallon offset. But you can see, since those have been preheated on top, they are combusting immediately. So let's get our door closed and go get our ribs on. Okay, we've been running right along at 270 degrees Fahrenheit. And all day I've been following the Jerby fire method, which is just placing two splits front to back towards the back of our firebox with three logs. Uh, you almost can't even see them, but there's three there t uh, pushed tightly together. And now once I get this door closed, it won't be quite an open flame that'll dial right back down, but that is holding 270 degrees Fahrenheit like clockwork. 
let's get a temperature on our ribs. So we've got our two with the toothpicks, which are our experimental ribs, and the other two are our base. Let's get a temperature, try not to hit the bone. I think we're in the 177, go all the way down here, 180. So I think it is time to wrap, so I'll meet you over by the counter. I've got some butter and butcher paper, and we'll wrap these up for the last hour or so. We are at the four hour mark right now to get to this, and that's about as dark as I want to get, and uh, that will also make sure that the last hour is all that we need to get the perfect tenderness and a little bit more bone pull back than what we have right now. Okay, so first we will do our two experimental ribs. So I'm just gonna lay a couple cubes of butter, which is already melting in the incredible late summer heat that we are getting here. September and it's already hotter than it was in July. So I'm just gonna flip that over, place it down, wrap these up, and I'll place our toothpick back in just uh, so I don't forget which are which. Set that aside, take it fast forward while I do the next three. All right, let's get these back on. So we've got our toothpick, control, toothpick, and control. Let those cook for about another hour. See you in a bit. Okay, our hour is up and our fire is starting to die down. We're just reading about 220 degrees Fahrenheit. So let me show you the fire box here. We have a choice. If we wanna tack up the sauce on our ribs, I could add some more wood uh, and bring that fire back to life. But rather than throw on some more wood, uh, really to get hardly any benefit out of that, let's take advantage of the residual heat that is kicking out of here with our fire box and use our charcoal grate accessory. I've done things like pizza on here as well as chicken suvaki, corn on the cob. It is very versatile and I think this is the first time I'm going to try uh, glazing my ribs but let's take advantage of a, almost now essentially this charcoal bed. I think it'll do the trick and uh, not have to go through any more of my premium firewood. Drop our grate in like so and I'm just curious get a see if I can get an IR temperature. Ooh. It's reading about 328 degrees on the side. So that is going to be more than enough heat. I'll just rake these coals underneath, get our ribs, and we'll be ready to glaze them up. Push these coal bed right underneath, spread those out so we get nice even heat. I know you probably can't see it on the camera, but this is a semi-insulated firebox design, which means there's an air gap between these two pieces of steel, and that will help keep this coal bed glowing for hours. If I were to come out here later tonight, once we lost all of our sunlight and give this a quick little kick with the ash tool here, uh, you'll see those glow right up. So even hours after we lose our fire, that is no problem to get it going again. One of the advantages of a semi-insulated without being so insulated that it's too efficient and I start to run into some of the problems that I might get if I was using more of my Kamado style grills where they're very energy efficient and hard to get a nice clean combustion. So it'll be a little bit easier for you to see what's going on up here than down in the firebox. But for our sauce, the rub might not have won the uh, blind taste test, but this sauce from Goldie's is awesome. So I plan to use that. Let's get our ribs here with the toothpicks sticking out so I can keep track uh, as I will have to add that back in. So I put those both on the left and our base ones over here on the right. And these all have exactly what you want to feel. Those have loosened up really nice compared to before. So let's get these out. That's looking really nice. Got much better bone pull than what we had before. Really happy with that. Add a little bit of sauce to our bone side. Just enough to finish these four racks off and I'll be getting some more of that. All right, let's glaze our ribs. All right, I think we are ready. Let's see how we're doing. Oh yeah, that's tacking up beautifully. Get these off. I will meet you over by the counter for the taste test. My family and guests are a little camera shy after swimming in the pool all day. So I've taken a, a rack of each inside and not told them what the toothpick signifies, but to let me know if they prefer the toothpick, which is the bacon injected versus the regular rack. And I've kept uh, a rack of each out here for ourselves so we can do our taste test. Let's get a couple bones, some great color smoke ring very juicy if i were to squeeze that which i'm not going to do on our control ribs let's get our injected ribs and from a color perspective 
those are looking pretty much identical. Although there I can see the hole from where we injected, but otherwise there's nothing visually between these two. Let's dive in for a taste test. Well, the sights and sounds in front of me are a thing of beauty. I wish I could share them with you uh, along with everyone inside. But let's do our taste test. This is our control rib first. Mm. Perfect doneness is exactly what I want where I can get a bite through consistency, not fall off the bone, but also not so much tug that I end up in a wrestling match with it. In terms of the flavors itself, this is just a symphony, honestly, of flavors. The first thing you notice is a bit of that sauce. You get a little bit of that bite. You know, maybe that's the vinegar. I think the first thing that I notice. Then we start to get into our dry rub. So salt, pepper, the garlic, the savory, the earthiness. And that fades into smoke. I've used this analogy before. Smoke on an offset, it's not necessarily more smoky, but it's a little bit like a salt dry brine where it penetrates all the way through. And it's just an amazing flavor. I get one more bite. Mm, they're really good. All right, moment of truth. Let's go for our injected rib. Cheers. Mm. Wow. I actually was not expecting it to be that different. I'm going to take another bite and see if I can come to grips with what we're tasting here. Hang on. Well, now I'm wondering what I'm going to do with all the leftover bacon that we cook in our house because this this is honestly pretty remarkable. And just like on beef, where if we inject some tallow, that makes a huge difference on things like brisket. If you haven't seen that, you can trim your own brisket, render your own fat and inject it. I've done a head to head experiment comparing this against the expensive off the shelf stuff. And I couldn't tell any difference, even though both injected is better than a non injected method. And here on pork ribs, this does not disappoint. So unpacking the flavors. It doesn't taste like we are eating a piece of bacon, but you get a little bit of that almost lushness on the mouth that is it's kind of got a smoother, richer depth of flavor than what I was getting on the first rib. And then everything else, as I explained, sort of the vinegar, our dry rub and the smoke, that part is exactly the same. But it's like there's this extra sensation when you bite into it and all those flavors just sort of run across your tongue. I am assuming this is what we've got from injecting our fat here. That's a similar experience that I get when I'm injecting beef. It's fantastic. So I'll let you know on the bottom of the screen what the vote was inside as they don't know which of the two they are eating right now. But that's it for today. I'm James from Sokadad Barbecue signing off. And if you have any questions, want to hang out in a bit more of a one on one manner, be sure to check out my members live section where I go live and we answer questions and talk about barbecue in a one on one setting versus these pre recorded videos. That's it for today, though. I'm James from Sokadad Barbecue signing off. And remember, don't be afraid to fire it up.